This morning, our worship is with uh, Chaplain Polite. Now, the really cool thing, if you don't know Chaplain Polite, is that depending on where you went, you could hear a lot of different things about him. You could, you could go to Spain. We have an Adventist school there. You could go to Union College, and uh, they could tell you that he is uh, very diverse in his communication skills and abilities. Um, I happen to be excited that he learned the second best version of Spanish because they don't really speak real Spanish in Spain. Yes, okay. And... Uh, <laughs> You could, go to, you could go to Oakwood, and they could tell you how he uh, impacted their campus while he was uh, studying his master's degree. Or you could go to Regent University, and they could tell you um, about his doctorate in strategic communication and how he's influencing that field. Um, you could Google search and see that he's been featured in the Associated Press and Huffington Post for his work in advocacy. Uh, you might be able to call Tavis Smiley and see how he's partnered with Tavis Smiley to impact his local community. But I think what's the most amazing thing about Pastor Polite isn't so much that he um, is willing to step out of his comfort zone for the cause of Jesus Christ, is that the amazing thing about him is that whatever zone he steps into, he makes it about Jesus Christ. And so this morning, while he shares with us and he takes us into a zone that it will be new to us because it's coming from him, will be different, we can trust and we know that he carries the spirit of Jesus with him. So I'm going to pray one more time just to invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and open our ears. Holy Father, you know your servant and you know your gospel. You know that the gospel has been working in your servant as he's been thinking about what you would have him to say. So, Father, I ask and pray that you prepare our hearts for the gospel to work in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, Andrews University. Super excited to be here to talk about this identity thing a little bit and to have the privilege to do it to the backdrop of Black History Month. That's just major for me. Um, some people here on this campus are trying to still figure out why do we celebrate Black History Month? And I think it's a good question that probably has not received the best answers in the past. The reason we still celebrate Black History Month is because those individuals whose stories we are not familiar with, we will forget about them and consequently devalue their existence. So we as humans value the individuals whose stories we know the most of. So there's this phrase that you guys may get from time to time, and it may sound rude when somebody says something like, well, who are you? If you look at the etymology of that phrase, though, that goes back to individuals who are asking about your history. So if you are to go into ancient times and hear that same phrase, well, who are you? That would usually spark a conversation where you go through your genealogy, letting people know who you are. So I am going to talk about this identity by starting here with this picture on the screen. And I want you to look at this young baby boy. And man, doesn't he look cool? Doesn't he look happy? He is definitely a superman, a superman indeed. The question that I have to start off our discussion this morning is, why do we call this baby black? As I'm looking at the picture a little bit more closely, I recognize that he has some beautiful black hair and some awesome, big, bright black eyes. But that color does not match the color of his skin. So why is it that individuals would call this baby black and feel as if they have done him a just service, as if they've just pinpointed him spot on and described exactly who he is? Why is that baby called black? Let's look at another slide of another baby. Look at this guy. Same big bright eyes, same look of potential, same look of beauty as well. I look at this young guy and I'm just like, man, beautiful baby. Don't know who your parents are, but they did a bang up job for sure, you know. Uh, <laughs> And when they produced you, man, they did and this, this awesome thing called creating. But as I'm looking at him, I'm trying to figure out why do they call this baby white? 
If you look at that picture closely, it seems like he has a backdrop of a white background. He also has a white little onesie on as well. And it is very clear that his skin color is not white. So why is it that he is called white? And why is that okay for describing his identity? Finally, I want you to look at these two, and I want you to really take in what your mind does as soon as you see them. There's something that happens in your subconscious that tries to communicate to your conscious mind that this picture is incorrect, that there is something about it that is not only odd, but also phenomenal. As you see this white child sleeping wonderfully close to a black child. The issue is, why do we feel comfortable describing this photograph in these terms? Why is it that these two individuals, these two babies, as they snuggle up next to each other, why is it that they don't understand the difference between black and white? And when is it that they are taught such things? Because as the study seemed to suggest, by the age of 10, both of them will not feel comfortable getting that close to each other. So what changes? Where do these terms come from? And why do we call them accurate when it comes to describing the identity of people? It is because, and I want to submit to you, that black and white is not the delineation of a race. Now, watch this. I do not believe in racism. I don't believe racism uh, exists. I think racism is a social construct that was made for a specific purpose. Now, I do believe in bigots, bigotry simply being defined, as it is in Webster's Dictionary, as an, as an individual who is intolerant of a different creed, a different race, or a different religion. So, I do believe in bigots, but I don't believe in racists. There is only one race. The human race. And as long as you can say that you are part of the human family and the human experience, then there is no such thing as racism. Racism would require multiple races. But since there is only one human race on the planet, how can you have racism? And why did someone construct that social hierarchy to try to make us think that there truly is a difference? Once again, why is it okay for us to call one baby black and the other one white? The answer to this question, I believe, resides somewhere about 1795 with a young, well, actually not too young at that time. He was a little bit older, middle-aged philosopher by the name of Johann, right? Okay, Johann Blumenbach is his last name, 1795. He creates what is known today as the Caucasian race. Notice I said 1795. It really didn't start catching any reputation until mid-19th century. Caucasian, and the phrase Caucasian, is pretty new when it comes to the map of our world and human history. Caucasians didn't exist before this time. Johann Blumenbach is known as one of the fathers of the Aryan movement, the Aryan race movement, which seems to suggest that Aryans, or those that we call white people, were the first people people. The reason you are called Caucasian is because it's a reference back to the Caucasus Mountains, where he says all of human civilization started. Well, National Geographic recently tried to take that to task and do research on human DNA. And they actually found that human DNA can be traced back to one central location, and that location is nowhere near the Caucasus Mountains. It's actually right in the heart of Africa. So, I'm looking at Johann Blumenbach, and I'm saying, hey man, what are you trying to build, and what are you trying to construct? The story continues, and this is where it reaches American soil, and I want you to really hone in on this. On American soil, there was not this delineation of blackness and whiteness until the late 1800s. 
This whole thing that we see in the Jim Crow South come up in the early 1900s of whites only, and then they said colored water fountain, whites only water fountain, colored entrance, whites only entrance. That did not really come into existence until the late 1800s. The question is why? What are these individuals trying to construct that make us okay with calling each other by an inaccurate description of our skin versus our place of origin? Pause. Every single people group throughout human history has always been called based on their place of origin. So why is it in America that something was built to identify you inaccurately based on the color of your outward appearance? America is the only country in world history that has ever done this. We are the only ones ever that created a yellow man, a red man, a white man, a black man, and a brown man. We are the only country ever that has built this construct. What are they trying to build? And what are they trying to get across? Late 1800s, there's an issue. Slaves are freed, right? The only delineation between a white poor person known as an indentured servant, which by, I do want to throw in here, do you know that white indentured servants were way more prevalent in the United States of America than black slaves? But do you know that both of them lived in similar conditions? They were both treated the same. The only difference between a white indentured servant, though, mostly made up of immigrants coming to the country, and a black slave was this word freedom. One was considered free, and the other one was considered a slave. But when you free all the black people, you no longer have that delineation. And now there's a part of history that many of you were never taught in your classrooms about the revolts that started throughout the South, specifically, where indentured white populace was starting to team up with newly freed black populace and revolt against the hierarchical system of classism in the South. Because the whites now said, wait, we're not being treated well, and they no longer have this delineation of, well, you're free and you're enslaved. So what ends up happening at this point? Now they start seeing each other as equals. There's no difference between me and you. You can't feed your kids, I can't feed my kids. So now the social construct must come up with a different way to separate our causes. They have to make sure that this poor class never unifies itself against the upper, mid, upper, uh, upper class echelon of the United States. Why? Because we all know that rich people are always in the vast minority on the planet. So if all the poor people as we kind of see in this chapter of history called the French Revolution, ever decide to unify themselves against the rich, they will bring down the social construct. I can't let this happen. I have to make a distinction. Somebody brings up Johann Blumenbach and says, what if we create a distinction that is based on colors? What about if we change the way we identify individuals based on the experience and not based on point of origin? And so they come up with a construct of whiteness and blackness. Notice, this has not come into American conversation until late 1800s. Black is not a race. Black is an experience. White is not a race. White is an experience. And so, how do I make this poor white person feel as if they are not the same as this poor black person? How do I keep everyone segmented and differentiated so that the system still lasts, so that it breathes, and so that it benefits from the dissension in between people groups? I make one feel good about who they are, and I make the other feel bad about who they are. What are the two colors that we use to express morality? Morality has always been discussed in terms of blackness 
and whiteness. White always representing the pure and the divine. Black representing the demonic and the downtrodden. And so I will call this group black, and I will call this group white. Now notice this. Every single white person in America should be offended by this. Every single one of you should be offended. Why? Because it does not point back to your place of origin. It is still a slap in the face. But the reason why white people don't mind that title being placed on them instead of you being forced to call them German or Dutch or Swedish, and why not British? Why is it okay to call you white? It is because since white is positive, you don't care. The only people that really care are the people who get the bad name, black. And here's the issue in the United States of America that all of us have to deal with. The fact is that blackness has always been seen from a negative light, while whiteness has always been portrayed in a positive light. And so the reason we accept our identities being described as colors, as if we're all just crayons in a box, is because it's okay if you are seen positively based on your color. And this thing has really taken over our religion too, hasn't it? And as we have seen throughout the annals of time, Christianity, especially in the Western Hemisphere, has been one of the greatest perpetuators of this colorism effect. Man, Dr. Henry, John Henry Clark writes it this way, the way that you see your God and the color that your God is will denote who you submit to. Therefore, if a conquering people can recreate God for you, you will submit to them because they represent divinity. Once again, that's Dr. John Henry Clark. Look up his writings. Very interesting. Now, some of you are saying, but he's probably a black Historian, is he not? Wouldn't he say that? Yes, he is. So let's go to some white historians. Let's go to Godfrey Higgins, for example. Godfrey Higgins was an, a historian in the 1800s as well as late 1700s, and he writes these words, that any time we attempt to go back to the origin of mankind, we always find a darker complexion. He then continues on to say that the Greek pantheon is just an adaptation of Egyptian gods. In his book, Celtic Druids, written in 1829, Higgins writes these words, that the original name of Zeus was Ethiop, where we currently get the name Ethiopia. Wait, are you saying that people actually name regions after the gods that they serve? Oh, heck yes. Where do you think we get the term Europe, which comes from the name of the goddess Europa? Yeah. Father Ferdinand wrote this in 1500, his journal of visiting Ethiopia. He says that even the Ethiopians carry with them the colorism of ages gone past, but it is in the inverse, he writes. He talks about that as you go back in time and start studying how people drew God, that in ancient times, God was always black in complexion, whereas the devil was white in complexion. This is where we get the black Madonnas that have become so popular in regions like Catalonia and Montserrat where people, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people come there to visit these images thinking that they are just an anomaly. When in actuality, when the Negro race was the power race on the planet, they always described God as a Negro. But as soon as the Aryan race came into power, they switched it. And as Higgin writes, the Greeks, all they did was take the same gods, give them Greek names and a different look. Romans did the same thing, Babylonians the same, as well as the Persians. And so now the Jesus that was taught 
to many missionaries, good-hearted individuals that brought them Bibles with European pictures that seemed to depict righteousness now was used to colonialize the mind, not save the soul. But can you find this in the Bible? I hear you talking about history and things and identity, but what does the Bible say about it? Well, the Bible agrees that this has been something that has been used over human history for centuries. Look at this text. This is from Daniel chapter 1 and verse 7, reading from the New Living Translation. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. And Azariah was called Abednego. Now, go to the next slide. This is what their names meant, where they came from. I want you to see this. Daniel Daniel represents God is my judge. Hananiah means Jehovah keeps him. Mishael means who is what Jehovah is. Azariah means Jehovah helps. Now, I do want you to know that a scholar here at Andrews University actually did some of the best work on these names and where they are derived from. His name is William Shea, did a study on these names back in 1988 right here at Andrews University. You should be able to access his work there in the library. And he talks about the fact that these were the meanings of their first names. But watch what their names are turned to when they get to Babylon. If you could show those names and their meanings. Belteshazzar means Bel protects the king. Bel being a more general name for the god Marduk. Marduk who was the chief god amongst the Babylonians. Okay, then you have a Shadrach which means under Aku's command. Aku coming from Mishaku which was another name for Marduk. Meshach who is what Aku is. Notice his old name was who is like Jehovah is. Now is who is what Aku is. And then Abed Nego, which is actually a typo. It should say Abed Nebo if it was written in the original language, which means the servant of Nebo, who was the god of the moon in Babylon. Notice what the Babylonians do to our four friends as soon as they are attempting to conquer them. They change what they are called and they try to change what God looks like. Because if they can remember the God that looks like them, and if they can remember the names that attach them back to their place of origin, then they will never be colonized. To colonize the mind, I need to separate you from your past history as well as the God that looks like you. I need you to start serving the God that looks like me. And I can't have you remembering where you come from. The Hebrew boys went through this. And here's the only reason why I feel like the Hebrews were able to return and rebuild their nation. It's because they knew where to return to. If there's an identity crisis for the black American specifically, the Afro-American, it would be this. Once you tell me if you don't like it here, why don't you go home? Where's my home? I've done the genealogy studies. The furthest back that I could get is that my line was started here in the United States by a woman that was six foot two and had hair that went all the way down to the arch in her back. She was sold and then moved down to Mississippi where our family grew there right in the deltas underneath the oppression of slavery. I've only gotten back that far but I can't find out where she comes from. I don't know where my home is. So how can I return to rebuild my identity? 
And for so many here who are pushing, pushing the black individual to just get over it, I want you to try this on for size. We were enslaved for 430 years. 50 years after that, we were under the Jim Crow laws in this country. And since Jim Crow, we've only had 50 years. So after 500 years of oppression, you expect me to get over it in 50 years. You expect there to be no residual effects of how I was separated from my place of origin, my culture, and reintroduced to a God that doesn't look like me, not to save my soul, but to colonize my mind. And that's why today when I go to a hospital and they hand me an application, and that application says, what are you? I check other, because I'm not black. I'm not white. I'm a person in search of who I am. In closing, I want you to look back at this photograph, a photograph of these two children, and to notice that they currently don't know anything about this construct. So I can almost hear your question, well, what do you want to be called? Ah, it's not really about what I'm called. It's the fact that you would think to ask that question, that you would think enough of me to ask me, what do I want to be called? To allow me to tell you what my identity is, to take you through the story of my ancestors and how we are still a people in search of our place of origin. But in spite of all of that, have we not risen like the phoenix? Out of the ashes we do rise. Haven't we done amazing things not only for this country but for the world, although we have been cut off from our point of origin? No, I'm not black. I've only gotten as far as to say I'm African-American. African, where I'm from. American, where I am. And the space in the middle of those words that we call a hyphen represents the missing history that I'm still trying to find. Thank you very much.